Welcome to Awaken the Mind, the NLP and Hypnosis Guide, hosted by David Juhas. You're listening to Awaken the Mind, the NLP and Hypnosis Guide, a podcast that inspires the curious to the professional to discover meaningful content and pursue their passions. My name is David Juhas, and I'm a master NLP practitioner and hypnotist, best known for losing over 100 pounds and running six marathons in two years. And I'm sitting down with hypnotists, NLP practitioners, and coaches to talk about their process, the lessons they've learned, and how to make an impact in the lives of others. Our guest today is Amanda Wanowski. The Breakthrough Project was born out of overcoming adversity. My mission is to provide life-affirming change. Ever since I broke out from under the cloud of PTSD, my life has never been the same. I am humbled by the experience but want to use it to help the world more than anything. And while today I live in an extraordinarily different life from the one I was imprisoned in, I do realize that many people are still struggling with trauma and pain daily, residing from their personal and individual experiences. Triumphing over trauma is what I'm dedicated to achieving, the opportunity for expansion and growth is huge when an individual is able to take control of the daily stress, exhaustion, and life they are currently living. These experiences can be holding an individual back from recovering from PTSD, depression, anxiety. The Breakthrough Project heals the invisible scars, the ones that run deep, the scars that go unseen by the rest of the world. I'm in the business not only finding whatever is holding you back. Together, we dismantle, take apart, and destroy every part of it. I'm ready when you are. I'm in the business of life and bringing about change fast. Why? Because no one ever told me it should be any other way, Amanda. And please welcome our guest today, Amanda right. Wanowski. Amanda Wanowski. <laughs> You've got it. You've got it. It's funny that you said it that way, actually. It used to be spelled that way. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we had a bit of a shuffle up with the letters, but how are you doing? I'm it's doing. Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you. And I'm so happy that you are here today taking time out of your busy schedule because I know you're very busy. Oh, it's an exciting day today. I'm absolutely, I'm pinging about what I get to do this afternoon. So, Oh, cool, cool. What, yeah. You want to share what you're doing? Oh, yeah. So locally, there's this really gorgeous forest called Hartswood, uh, Hartswood Home, Hartswood Home Forest. And uh, I've been invited down there to a women's circle. And this afternoon, I'm going to do a bit of regression work around a big fire. Everyone's going to have sleeping bags. I'm going to be out under the tree canopy so in nature so I'm quite looking forward to that and then later on so I come home have some good like nourishing food and then this evening we're kicking back in a big moss um the words kind of left me now but it's like a a kind of it's almost like an outdoor sauna built so there'll be hot rocks in there and oh nice uh, from moss and stuff so yeah it's gonna be it's quite an exciting saturday (laughs) Cool. I'm getting this uh, picture of this this whole thing. I, I love nature, and yeah. Uh, yeah, there's something so peaceful about that. And the uh, the hot rocks. What is that called? Uh, like uh, I can't kind remember. of word? The word is totally left me now, and it's it's kind of like a um, it's, it's almost like it's like a sweat room that's been there, built. Okay. Yeah. So, but um, you just get in there, and it's really really hot, and you're all packed in, and like, people are bringing in these rocks that have been on a fire. <laughs> Like, it's less intimate and more just like really sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, you'll get to go into a kind of, there can be state shifts in that sort of environment because you've got to breathe because it's so hot. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it should be fun. Nice, nice. I, and I'm looking forward, I'd love to hear more about that afterwards. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Well, our backstory is we uh, just finished a uh, Melissa Tears training, an incredible training. I, I loved it. And uh, tell me about your experience while you was there. Um, I, how did I discover? So I had seen that Melissa was doing some work with someone called James Tripp in the UK. I know that he's coming over to the US to actually do some work with Melissa soon. And I saw her work and I had been doing a lot of inner child work with adults 
uh, often I find that's a good place to dive in and uh, work with to resource somebody in their current life. And Melissa was one of the few people that had written an entire hypnotherapy protocol dedicated to children. Mm. And I thought, wow, that's interesting because I'm tackling the inner child, but someone has written an entire pack for children. So to combine the, the now knowledge with the going back knowledge, I thought that would be really useful. I was also really... Um, why I dived in with Melissa particularly was she's a woman and I find that the hypnotherapy world and I could be wrong here is predominantly male and so to kind of have a voice out in the field that is so powerful and and so authentic and really knows her shit um to to actually find that person and so I messaged her and said can I please come and do your course I'll fly across in the UK and can you mentor me, please? And she she interviewed me and she was like, she swears a lot, doesn't she? <laughs> <laughs> a couple of times. <laughs> she was like, she was pretty cool about it all. And um, yeah, and so I came across and the course, um, it's just transformed how I've been working. I've taken a lot of it away. It's still bedding in. But what I find now is I don't really feel like anything can walk into the office doors that I can't create a structure for to deliver the change that I work with. So it's been, it's been amazing. Cool. Uh, while you were there, I enjoyed, uh, you're talking about the different things that you did. You went to the, tell me about the, some of the things you did while you were in New York. Oh, so yeah. So <laughs> Melissa sets it up so that if you have traveled in, you can be a tourist and like <laughs> New York blew my mind because I've come across from the UK where if you've read Harry Potter, all the streets kind of look like that. So like every Diagon Alley, everything's a bit wiggly and windy and <clears throat> you've just kind of got to work it out. And then, so I was there and I was like, I was having to like streets, blocks, avenues. I, I didn't have a clue how to get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I was genuinely working within like an anxiety state on arrival. <laughs> <laughs> which was great because it, it, it kind of gave me an opportunity to see how effective that work cracks you out of stuff, right? Like pulls you back out of it. But the things that I was doing, I kind of blagged my way into the, um, what's it, the Brooklyn uh, band. So what's that, Brooklyn Arts and, like there was a, so I, I blagged myself into like a hip hop morning that was for kids in the, <laughs> <laughs> for the local school kids and they brought in some of the best spoken word artists in the states and i just kind of went in and i was like i see it's unticketed but could i watch and um and there was this guy there called marcus who was a preacher and he was somebody who uh studied english literature and i was talking to him he said don't worry you just come in with me and uh, <laughs> i was like cool so i got to see something i shouldn't have seen at all at, um, at that and then I went and saw rehearsal with the um, Philharmonic and that was just an extraordinary experience wow. to have inside of everything that we were learning because we were starting to do that really big piece weren't we about orchestrating your mind to see a person so for therapy and for treatment when the person sits in front of you you're organizing your mo your um uh, your uh, mirror neurons. So you're organising your mirror neurons when they sit down so you see the absolute best of what they can be before they've even opened their mouth and like how that energy transmits through the session. And watching, so never seeing classical music before and then watching how the symphony took place and how the conductor, because it was a rehearsal, I could hear the conductor sort of saying, when I do this with my body, this is the sounds I expect you to create. So they were playing in multiple channels. It wasn't just a case of playing an instrument. They were emotively organizing the sounds that would come out of the instruments based on the body language of the conductor and the audience. And on top of that, I was experiencing the resonance of that because I was in that place. So the vibrational um at, you know what was coming out of that wood and that the, those instruments was actually passing through my cells and so I was experiencing that emotion in a way too so it was an extraordinary way to kind of put together what I had 
observed in the class and then to watch it play out in real time in this incredible space with this absolutely wow. phenomenal music. So I was kind of having experiences like that <laughs> <laughs> like in, inside of this insane course. So, yeah, it, was, it was pretty good. And like something that really um, it, I found transformational about that was it was re- everyone was so progressive. So I've done courses around, like in other places and it just like people aren't necessarily thinking to the fringes of what is possible and to just allow the rule book and the the way that things are being studied to be put to one side and say what happens when you play with this or do this so i always i'm always very interested in the outliers so when something hasn't worked or when something someone has achieved something when no one else is doing it so an example of that is uh, someone i know lost 3 stone um running or but, um, and the big piece for them, but they, and they just did it. And I was like, how did you get all that weight off so quickly? What was it you were doing? And we were doing mind work the whole time. And what we were kind of finding was that whenever there was a blip or a stick, we would work on an emotional piece as well. And then there would be some sort of reorganization and they would just move forwards and can continue to lose weight. So it was quite an exciting foray into, and then we documented everything that this person did, like why they were successful. And um, so it was, it's kind of, that's how I tend to look at this work. Like why did, why did that work? And why isn't that working? Because I'm not a doctor or a psychologist. I don't have the advantage of being able to suggest that they take a chemical solution to to organize the particular state that they're in. So I have to look at alternatives. And um, it's just been such an exciting road for me that way. So I've played with things like lucid dreaming with my client base and um, like organizing your subconscious overnight in your dream states so that you wake up knowing what you need to do. yeah very very cool stuff and um there's there's lots of other pieces that we kind of work with in terms yeah. of so like for me like this is a, a dive off from one of your questions i suppose was one of my continuous flashbacks that was happening um it was a pretty unpleasant one i was um, in that i was seeing the opera so i was um i was out on the ground in afghanistan Um, And so part of my story and my PTSD really comes from uh, my experience of being deployed as a medic. And I was specialised into the field hospital, the role four, and I worked in operating theatres. And one of the flashbacks that would continuously come up was of um, someone had died and uh, I just couldn't shift this image. It would just play out and I would just be stuck in it like a freeze frame just like a bit like NLP where you've just got the picture, couldn't do anything about it. And it was using an alternative solution to problem solve my way out of it to see how I shifted the picture. And what that was, was I got a piece of paper and I let myself free draw the picture of what I was seeing. And what I was seeing in my mind's eye was the operating table with the person and the whole um, chaos of everything that was going on around me. When I free drew it, I drew an outline above the person on the table. And that shocked me because I did all this with my eyes closed. When I looked at it and what I thought I'd drawn was just like another energy form. Call it what you will, soul, whatever. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I can do something with that. So I went upstairs, self-hypnotized, brought up the image. And instead of seeing the person that I couldn't really help at that point, do anything I then had an option on an outline of energy that was him and now and then all of a sudden and in this case Afghan men are very attached to flowers they mean something to them and this guy in the energy was holding flowers and I said to him do you want to take those outside and he nodded and I said okay I'll show you where to take them so we walked out of the field hospital stood where I would always go and watch the sunset. 
um, which is like this big, enormous orange orb. Like desert sunsets are quite special. And um, I knew what I needed to do was just to turn away. And I turned back and the flowers were on the floor and the thing, the, the energy that I'd led outside had gone. So this was all playing out in my unconscious mind. Um, I came back and then, and that was it. And then I opened my eyes and I thought, right, let's challenge this. Let's see if I can bring up the flashback again. And I went and I looked at the image of the theatre and it was completely clean, like it had been cleaned. Uh -huh. It was ready. And what I learned from that for myself, and that flashback never, ever came up again. And it was that whole sequence of events was a monster. Um, what I learned from that for myself and from my clients is when you get fluid with the ideas of the universe in terms of in, in, internal picture treatment, you can you have more flexibility in your rules. So if we're trying to, so I was trying to work through my problem and my flashback with the rules of now, like that we don't have a soul and that I'm working in three, four dimensional, and time is as it is. When I when I allowed the idea of just a bit more into the picture, it it broke down the belief system that was holding the PTSD in place. It took one thing, one strand of an idea. And then I had the movement to change the picture in such a dramatic way that whenever I look at that memory and that scene now, I see nothing but a clean theatre and I never got that flashback ever again. Nice. Yeah, so that's kind of how my experiences tend to play out in how I, because then I bring that to my client base that's what I do. Yeah. They've got something they cannot shift, they cannot get rid of. I I will utilize something like that. Nice. It's kind of cool. Yeah, that is really cool. And it, it's also cool that uh, you are practicing what you know. Uh, you experience this and you can share that with others who, who maybe don't see that as a possibility. Yeah. So that's that's awesome that you're able to to work with people like that, to give them that hope. It's always really, um, for me, when I sit opposite someone and I describe to them where I was 24 months ago and I show them a picture of the shell of the woman that was living and I say, look, this is me now and this is the work that I did, you can just see the glimmer of hope and optimism. In, like It's visible. It's like if she can do it, then maybe I can too. Nice. Yeah. So, so it's always, I, I, hypnotherapy pretty much saved my life, without a doubt. Nice. So nice. I'm, I'm committed to that pathway for as long as I live now. Cool. Well, share with me about you growing up. What? Uh, tell me about what was it like for Amanda well, growing up. What was it like for me growing up? Well, I. So um, it's an interesting journey. Um, I, I've moved 39 times in my <laughs> lifetime. We did a lot wow. of that. And, um, it was, it was turbulent. I grew up in inner city London and my mum, God love her. Um, she's not alive anymore. Um, had serious mental health problems and we, I was sort of living inside that world. Uh, so I actually did spend a proportion of my early years or sort of teens homeless and also spent time in foster care and I wasn't a good student at all I left school with one GCSE but the thing the crowning grace the thing that I had was sporting prowess so I um I was a county 1500 meter champion wow. and so wow. although I could barely read at school I could run so it kind of gave me position it kept me safe and so my life was kind of, for many years, was built around my physical attributes. So, uh, so growing up, yeah, I was pretty, I was pretty raggedy. I, I spent no time in the house. Kind of, we were kind of like the kings and queens of the bricks, the kids that I rolled around with. We were, we just were outside all the time, climbing trees, buildings, being in places we absolutely shouldn't have been. <laughs> but it kind of it equipped me with a grittiness and a resourcefulness that I definitely needed as an adult. Uh, yeah. So, but 
yeah, my childhood was kind of awesome, but it doesn't sound it. <laughs> I had a lot of freedom, probably way too much. Um, uh, but it's what it did equip me with was I spent a lot of time being told I wouldn't achieve things. And um, I've spent, I mean, I actually believed until I was about nine, maybe 25 that I was dyslexic. So... And that's what I'm saying. I believe that was the case. But because so much was happening around me, and I've noticed this in kids too, when they're coming in with like that shot mindset, so eyes on stalks, can't concentrate, can't take in information, can't sit still, and people start saying, oh, it's ADHD or they're dyslexic. It's like, okay, let's get a history on this kid. Let's see what's going on. And let's make sure they're just not stuck in their long-term memory, which is essentially what was happening to me. I couldn't learn because I was on stress mode all the time. I was looking for where the next thing was coming from. Um, when I broke out of that, it was actually much later on as an adult, I started to write for the first time in my life. So you've got some of the material I wrote. That only started happening 20 months ago. Nice. Yeah, so, it's, so this work that we're doing is absolutely phenomenal and the limits of what it can achieve I don't think are necessarily understood yet at all in terms of turnaround so it's really exciting <laughs> you shared a little bit about uh military experience and talk about not necessarily that but just what led you up to hypnosis and and this work so there was some change that took place yeah I so I'd been in the armed forces I decided to come out I had children my mental health was already quite bad at this stage but it was suppressed I just wasn't seeing I wasn't letting myself see what I was in um so I had to leave and then I had my children and at the same time because I because I was specialized in anatomy and physiology I'd been working doing a lot of body work with people and solving pain that way and I'd had a continuous Achilles problem for about eight years, which I mentioned earlier on, I, I used to run. So losing the access of being able to run, which was my main compensation, was, was something I was chasing. I was trying to discover how to heal myself. So I was doing all this body work. And um, I went on this course, which was called PDTR, which is proprioceptive deep tendon therapy. It was 18 months and um, what I was learning about was the sensory nervous system. So, and so all the different channels in which information comes into our nervous system and how we, how, how that can be manipulated for pain. And so I particularly studied the skin deeply and what, what, while that was all going on, what transpired was halfway through the course, we did a piece around emotions and the lead lecturer was like, 90% of all the problems you will see will have an emotional core or it will be here. And the pain will be linked to this piece. And so we were introduced to a concept around, I think it's an NLP concept, but some of the other guys were doing something called CRT, which is cellular release therapy. And the guys that have that are over in uh, Colorado, Boulder, and... Um, and Drucker is absolutely amazing. She's probably got 40, 50 years of trauma hypnotherapy, like just a wealth of understanding. And I, so everyone was talking about this stuff and I was like, what's that? Why is everyone doing that? I'm now doing this course and I now need to know about this thing because it's 90% of all the problems are this. Why am I messing about with people's bodies? Because um, there, there was some frustration there. So I went and um, my friend Ian was trying to get them into the country and he was having trouble filling the course. And I was like, I really want to do this course. Just leave it with me. <laughs> and so I basically drummed up and loaded in, like enough candidates onto the course, told Ian it was full, and then said, just get them over because <laughs> I wanted to do it. Because <laughs> so I couldn't leave my kids to go over to the US at that point because they were so small. And they came over and the entire pack was, um, it was just, it was amazing. And to learn it, I had to go through the process. 
Um, and it, it was a hypnotic process in, in essence. They, they would probably say deep uh, meditation, relaxation techniques. Um, but like essentially we were, I was experiencing hypnotic states and we were clearing out loads and loads of my material or at least getting an altar on it. And I actually hit, I would, I think now, a quite a few transcendent states. And um, it was, but what was happening was big things were just falling away. And I came up from one hypnosis in particular and just, I just realized for the first time in probably six years, I was aware of my senses. I had been so numb for so long and it was it was almost overwhelming getting it all back uh, but what it also brought back was feelings which I hadn't had either so I really had been sleepwalking around um, and so it was that it was going on that journey and I, I, I came out of that trance and just went I have to do this for the rest of my life this is what I do now and I have to make sure other people can access it um, but it wasn't enough for me to just have that single course. So after that week, I came home, things started to bed in and I knew what I needed to do, but my mind had gone into sort of some unusual state. So for about the next month, I sped read maybe 15 books and did four courses, um, all around this type of material and took it in and can remember it all. I'd never done that before. Bear in mind, this was the kid that left school with one GCSE. I was told she was dyslexic. So it's, yeah. And within a month, I'd seen 40 people. Every, like, I, I, like, as soon as I got back, I just told people what I was doing. I had people coming in every night because my children, I had to get them to bed. And I just started working with it all. And people, things were just starting to change up so quickly for people. It was... It was such a shock, like how well this work was embraced. Um, and that was uh, May, June, June, June 20, where are we, 2017. So we're 2019 now. You've got some really exciting things coming up. You were talking about a process that you use, like a metaphor, uh, a mapping kind of. Yeah, so I, I wanted to be, uh, so I was a mountain leader for years. So I spent 10 years working in the outdoors. And we spent a lot of time doing micro navigation and uh, lots of time in mountainous regions. And it kind of, I never thought that that time spent there was going to map across, quite literally map across into my life now. So when someone comes in and they're talking to me about their problems, it's like really like tuning into the language that they're using about, uh, often I find people are talking about journeying in their language or that things are in their way i have a block when someone says me i have a block i don't think they've got something stuck inside them i think what does the block look like is it a big piece of concrete what is it so tell me about the metaphor that you're using that you feel is in your way and what i will always do is under trance i will get them to position the block like on a map so if something is in your way you either want to be to the side of it in front of it or you want it behind you right yeah so and and the place that i always go for is i say to them right if you can can you create this into a thing that you can have it left and behind because when we put the words together in language we've left behind the block so but people i found and Someone, uh, I'm just looking for the name now. I can't remember his name. <laughs> I'm rubbish with names. But uh, Andy, I can't remember his name. I'll get it for the show notes. Um, so this movements and metaphor was, metaphors of movement was where I learned this. But I just started to really apply it in everything that I was doing. Um, so an example being feelings. When we think about feelings, when we have a feeling, they, they, when I was talking about universal rules, they break them. Feelings can travel through time and space. Like they're kind of like wispy and floaty almost. They, they're, they're not locked or rooted in anywhere. So when you're 
moving through your life, your set of feelings can kind of follow you. And a bad feeling that you learnt somewhere along the way could essentially pop up at another time in your life and re-evoke a sense of how you are experiencing things. Now, so if you're using that map that I was talking about, you would never ever want to leave that feeling loose. You need to put it in something. And so like under trance, we kind of like, and I never suggest what they use. They come up with the material always because it always has a deeper effect. Um, and I think there's more metaphor for them available inside of if they if their box looks a particular way or you get an idea of like how awful the feeling is by what they want to contain it in. If someone's telling me I want to put that in a safe, I'm like, this is something they want locked down. Um, and then what they do is they have an opportunity to move it behind them. And I'll even get them to do it physically, even though they've got their eyes closed. I'll say, right, get that behind you and to the left and leave it there. And then often like with, with the meta pattern, I now make sure that they do something around that particular piece that kind of shows that they have created a safe space and a thankful space and a, a grateful space for it too, because it was there in terms of protection. And then I get them to look at their inner world now without the block or the feeling in front and what does it look like? And they're normally then starting to talk about expansion and open views or like roads in front of them with no obstruction. And what we know is that what we feel on the inside, we project on the outside. So if their metaphor internally changed, their external world and life changed too. And that's how I use this work. Yeah, I really like that. I'd, I'd never heard of that uh, type of uh, structure. Very cool. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, you've done some really impressive things. And uh, one of them you had mentioned about trauma teams. You had done some. Can you share something about that? Yeah, sure. So um, I deployed as an operating theater tech. So in uh, Afghanistan. And what that means is I can do any job except surgery and anesthetist in operating theaters. So we would scrub. We would take care of all the equipment. We could build the theater, shut it down, airway management. Basically, any all singing, all dancing theaters, theaters team, because you just didn't have the resources to have multiple people doing the jobs. So you wanted people that could do all of them. And we spent to deploy. When I deployed to Afghanistan, we were at the height of fighting out there, and so they would spare. They spent two years prepping us for moving into what was essentially one of the most high high performing trauma teams in the world at the time. And a lot of the stuff that we did was around things like human factors. So something that I instinctively got very interested in was human behavior in terms of performance under heightened levels of stress. Um, and what actually happened and transpired out there was something switched. And when the purpose is so, so big, the levels of cohesiveness go through the roof. And you also see um like like a communitas and kind of like we were trained so well that a casualty could come in and there would be 15 to 20 of us around this person and we'd be operating in silence not bumping into each other doing what we needed to do at the right time and because we were all so connected in that moment and that was that type of training and that type of teamwork and that we were taught about languaging followership leadership like how to merge it all to keep everyone safe because we could be going around the clock. There were some days where it'd be like an 18 hour shift. You'd get two hours, come back and carry on. Um, so to, to maintain that level of operational effectiveness, it took deep training, but a lot of it was being done subconsciously, but also inside of like adrenaline and like some receptors because when that stuff was going on, you are experiencing like all sorts of heightened chemistry because it was life or death. So it's, it was really, it was such, as much as it was hard and the things that I observed weren't always easy, it was one of the most outstanding things I will ever have gotten to do in my life. And uh, it was, a, it was a, an absolute honour to be part of that field unit. Um, 
yeah and it was busy it was like i i think i did 900 over 900 hours of trauma out there. so it was it was a big 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 op oh. but, um but it, it the work comes across now in what i get to do in here and particularly when i'm hearing about ptsd and and, and my own journey with that has made me so much more attuned to seeing where it might be sitting in an individual so um so examples are i had a i had a person who had um an all was having an olfactory flashback and what that means is they were smelling it was a smell that was repeating in their mind and they were re-smelling it and they were then being having the emergent experience and that was going on for six months and it was possible with a therapy that's very similar to, so I was combining hypnotherapy and something that's very similar to EDMR. And we broke the, the ownership of that. You know, we, co we collapsed that olfactory flashback in a minute and a half and it stopped and it's never come back. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that's one that people don't recognize as, as a flashback. But anything that repeats and comes back and shows up in your body is essentially a flashback. So they can be they can be present in terms of vibration or a sound that somebody might hear. It's not just the visuals. It's not just I see something. Um, and often, like I, I encourage all practitioners to kind of understand about emotional first aid and how that plays out. So someone can have an incident, family member, anybody, they can be going through something really tough. And PTSD for ev everyone, it, it to understand that one person's trauma is very different to another. So like what could traumatize one person might not traumatize another. So somebody could lose their dog and someone could get run over and they could both feel as bad. So the, it's just recognizing that it's the experience for the individual that matters. Because um, lots of people think, oh, I haven't got it because I haven't, I haven't done what you did and I haven't been a paramedic and I'm not a fireman, I'm not a policeman. How could I possibly have experienced that? And so I find that a lot with the um, postnatal community. So women that have had babies don't necessarily recognize that there's been a process of being traumatized at a particular point. And they don't seek help because they don't see it that way. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's a big, vast beast. However, when you get to the thing, and that doesn't take long, you can dismantle it so quickly. And because it tends to have like, a, it's not got a fast onset. It's just, it can do, but in terms of like what is happening in the person, so people kind of like kind of start dismantling over a period of time so the incident happens and it might not be they don't present until a year later and so they can't actually see that it was this incident that they're now sat in depression and not wanting to eat and completely antisocial and not having a friend circle and not feeling and what they thought is i got depressed and what they don't recognize is that there was an incident that triggered a neurological change it's a human condition that we're meant to learn from and sometimes we just get stuck in that process and hypnotherapy and nlp and these amazing modalities are just so good at prizing this stuff apart it's uh, it's it's unreal so on that note what about people who who know someone that's going through ptsd or somebody who is going through ptsd uh that kind of trauma what what can you say to them? How can they get help? You know, how can they? So who can they approach? Yeah, what's the? Um, what would I suggest? So okay, so if it's like so, if, so if they're in it, so what I'm going to do? I'm going to do two groups. So I'm going to do something's happened to someone. So you've been driving your car and something's happened that day. So for for anyone, you can do emotional first aid. And what that is, is that you listen without judgment to what happened to that person and they get to speak all of it. So often I do find that it can literally be being held together by the unsaid. So there's a wow. thing that someone doesn't want to say about an incident, so like some shame or some guilt, and that is holding them in the cycle. 
um, like an example of this was I had a client who was was crashed into by somebody and um, and they became reclusive. They didn't want to leave the house. And when I was getting the details of the incident, they said I could see the earring and it was nighttime. And I was just like, hmm, can you please tell me what color this person was that crashed into you? And they said, oh, they were black. And I picked that up because they described the earring that they could see at night. What I then realized was the agoraphobia component had arisen because it was a fear of seeing that that type of person on a daily basis. It was causing a flashback. So what the woman could not say because it wasn't socially acceptable was, I'm afraid of black people Mm. because of what happened to me. As soon as she said it, it just, it fell apart. That is, that's fascinating. That's really interesting. Isn't it? Yeah. So, um, but so if you, you're in an incident or you know someone that's had something happen, first thing is let them speak about it. And just don't interrupt, just listen. And if you need to, nod and say, "Uh uh-huh. And if they do pause, just say, and offer them the opening to to deliver more if they need to. And then check in on them two weeks later. If they're not sleeping, if they're not eating, if they've not, well, if their sleep has changed or if their eating habits have changed, that's a point to note. Something's not quite right. If they're still overthinking the incident, or it's got some sort of movement that's something to know that's what at that point two weeks is usually my marker for things should have settled down they should have processed it if they haven't that's when they go and seek assistance and really it's anyone that's professionally trained to listen and understand um finding people that understand ptsd is they're out there but whether like finding people like me that kind of apply that sensory component to it. I only started doing that because I felt like I needed to understand that more. So in truth, I wouldn't know where to send people if they were, if they were experiencing stuff like an olfactory flashback, like who could, I think EDMR works really well. I think uh, IEMT works really, really well. These both eye, the eye movement stuff. I think that right. stuff is rocket fuel i love it um and i think gentle hypnosis is really good anything that you can work with metaphor is absolutely amazing uh because if they're in it you don't want them in it so much but if you can say what is that like and they can give you a picture like it's like i'm being like i'm under a rock or like they haven't been squashed they're like the pressure of it you can work with the rock work with the rock like the yeah. problem that their the metaphor you'll collapse their problem yeah that's so it is i think it's about reaching out to like local like anyone that's trained in like type that type of physical problem yeah. or trauma because that, that yeah it over here it's you just go to your doc and then you kind of approach um like external people like me so I wouldn't really know how it would work in the U.S., but I would track down people that say they specialize it and then ask them about it. Well, and thank you for sharing that about the the emotional first aid. That I think that's an important component that uh, a lot of people who maybe are not trained can can do and offer. Anybody can do it. Anybody can do that. Anyone. Anyone. Right. It is, it's like it's just masterful listening. You know? Yeah. So what's co- you got some cool stuff coming up next for you. What's going on? Yeah, I've got, what am I doing? So I, um, I'm i going to get to write some stuff for disadvantaged youth. So I'm bringing kind of like an NLP model into the, that group. Um, so these kids have, they have been homeless. They've either been refugees and they're now in sort of like state care. And what they've asked me to do is bring out a package that, they, they've basically given me free reign. What do I think these kids need? Now, what's super, super useful is I had been one of those children. I had been in that very system when I was 15. So to be able to now create so, – so a lot of it, I think, will be built around self-belief and like really ramping up the resources that that type of child ends up with 
which are there's a certain type of grit, resourcefulness, and survivorness about kids that get to that point. And they've got a lot of stuff going on, but they do spend a lot of their life being told they're not going to be successful. It's not true. So it's it's really going to be about dismantling beliefs so that they can go forwards. So that's that's one piece. That's really I'm really excited about that. That I've been asked to actually write and create stuff for for that type of group. It's really fun. Awesome. Uh, so what's anything else coming up next for you? Uh, trainings or? Ooh, where am I off to? I'm off to, so I'm heading across to Portugal next week. So I'm on something called the uh, Wave Maker Retreat, uh, which I'm going to be hanging out with some people that have created amazing packages and put stuff out around the world um, to bring about big change. So that's on the horizon. So I'm really looking forward to just being in the mix. And the great thing is, well, so something that I really am hooked on and love and study and a lot of it came from my years in the outdoors. Um, I used to be a bit of an adrenaline junkie, um, but it was because of the trauma that I'd experienced, my way of experiencing being alive was to track down flow states. I didn't really understand that when I was younger. It was just that was what I hankered after because like the illumination of life after those experiences was just so addictive and so when I discovered this work and I had that awakening I really I knew I was like this is a flow state but it's not like one I've ever experienced mm. so what was that and immediately you have the taste for it and you're like I want more I want more how do I get it and so going out to the wave maker retreat I'll get to surf most days so the idea being that you surf you kind of get into that flow state and enjoy that, and then you come and create material for your business. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Well, that sounds awesome. How can our listeners get a hold of you? Your website. Okay, so you can you can find me on Instagram. So, and it's just my whole name, Amanda underscore Wanowski. Um, I'm on Facebook as the Breakthrough Project. And I also have a group on Facebook, where, which is um, uh, the Breakthrough Project Rising Strong. And I put a lot of material up in there. I will always answer people's questions. Currently, there's a nice big 25-minute uh, download, sleep download. So people can just get my voice in its full chocolate tones, just like helping them drift off to sleep. Um, that's been really popular. Everyone's asking for that. So, um, cause my, my kind of idea is that I don't, I think there's an opportunity to do big work with this work and particularly with the internet and the way that we can just reach. So like there's, there's all sorts of avenues in which this work can be made available and accessible for free. Um, and you know, there's so many parts of it that I just love. So like all the body languaging, and kind of higher performance and, and how you can just change your language, like literally drip, dropping the words, um, like using the words so, because, and and can change your life if you know how, where to put them versus need, but, and should. So it's just, it's such an, an incredible place to be playing right now. I just feel so lucky to have found it. This has been a wonderful interview today, and it's great to see you as always. <laughs> I really appreciate what you talked about. And I also, you know, um, when you were talking about when you were younger and this this uh, stuff that made you who you are today, there was uh, something that was preparing you for for today. And I think that that is a beautiful thing that now you are this this light and this strength and this hope. For people who are, cry, so it's so nice. <laughs> I have three dollars. I'm really good at making people cry. <laughs> no, but you. but seriously, you know, you you were have been prepared for now, and yeah, and this thing that you can offer to people who experience the PTSD and the trauma and stuff like that. So yeah, thank it's, you it's, for doing what you do. And thank you. It was such such a joy and a pleasure to meet. You. I was devastated when I kind of had to leave New York. I was like, I won't hear David's soft voice anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but we got a podcast. So okay. <laughs> that's right. That's right. 
<laughs> so thank you. And all the show notes for today will be online and how to contact you and anything else that uh, we feel like throwing on there. We will. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks for having me on. Oh, uh, yeah, it was great to be introduced to your listeners. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you. And you come back again sometime. I would love that. I will. Okay, <laughs> right then. Thank you for joining us today with yeah. Awaken the Mind, Let's. hosted by David Juhas. Awaken the mind, you need to understand. If you can't, you must, and if you must, you can. Now that I got you, let me put you in a trance. Got you feeling hypnotic, your mind, let me massage it. Your thoughts are getting quiet, your stress subsiding. You starting to see images, but it ain't no mirages. Think it's time to calibrate. Calibrate. Take a breath and concentrate. Concentrate. Get into your subconscious. Time to feel the energy. The brain waves. Let's go deep into your memory. Beware of self. Let the worries melt. All you see is you and you don't see no one else. Auditory digital. Talking to yourself. It might seem bizarre. A feeling you never felt. This is your time to shine. Awaken the mind. The NLP and hypnosis guide. Yeah.